again. And we are certainly slipping against our planned agenda. And uh, is there anyone here who has the authority to tell me how long we have and how long we should go? <laughs> One of the things about a panel is you can just kind of go into it yourself. The uh, theme that we're going to discuss today is what must Asia know in order to uh, serve and to compete on a worldwide basis. We're going to use this process. Um, we're going to have each of the people on the panel make an opening remark, a couple of minutes of personal introduction, and then if they would address this particular theme, what must Asia know in order to serve and compete on a global, uh, on a worldwide uh, scale? Uh, then, um, depending on our time, we will have some interaction. We'll invite uh, different members of the panel to make comments on others' presentations. So, uh, let's begin on on my left. Uh, Nishi-san, my friend, would you begin for us? Uh, if you'll use the microphone, you can either take it out of the probably best to take it out. So, uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Yasan Nishi from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, my primary job is a university professor, and my secondary job is the consultancy service, providing consultancy service uh, on software testing. And Today is my role is the cat facing the lions or on behalf of Asian countries. Thank you. Yeah. Klaus, do you want to okay. tell us a little bit about yourself and make a comment on our thing? Yeah, I'm Klaus Pohm from Palulo. Palulo is a software engineering research institute at the University of Duisburg Essen, where I'm director of. The institute had about 150 to 200 staff research members. Um, my area is uh, requirements engineering, software services, and testing. And I guess I'm here to expand the scope of testing a little bit towards uh, the requirements dimension. So not only testing what a tester wants, but testing against the requirement that the product really fulfills its purpose. And we can go in detail, if you like, later on. Thank you. One observation that I sort of have uh, um, over the last two days is that um, I run a, a conference as well in the, in the US and Europe, and it's all about agile. Agile testing and different working, and, and talking about independent teams is, is, is no-go. And it changes the world, it changes how you work, it changes the people's behavior, it changes also the requirements for people. Um, however, here in Malaysia and in Asia in general, what I'm trying to see is, is we still do waterfall. Um, whether it's good or bad, it's something, something we should discuss, but it's something which um, struck me so far. John? Uh, John Hager. I think I've been testing for 32, 34 years, so I really don't know too much about it. Uh, but I think I'd like to agree with at least one panelist. I think software testing is more than just software, it's more than just testing. In my 30 plus years, I've done requirements, I've done systems engineering, I've done software engineering, programming, testing, a uh, little bit of hardware, and a lot of the soft sciences. And so I think one thing we may talk about and hit is, and we've heard a little bit already, is the, the notion of even things like psychology, sociology, and believe it or not, music and arts uh, as applied to, to software testing. Thanks, John. Uh, my name's Lee Copeland. I'm with Software Quality Engineering in the US. My role there is to be the program chair for all of our conferences. We run seven conferences a year now. Star East, Star West, and the new Star Canada conference. 
to run two conferences on uh, called Better Software and two on Agile Development. And so my role is to choose topics and choose speakers and these days that's a full-time job. Again, I appreciate being invited here. Uh, I'd like to start with some comments uh, based on what Eric just said. Um, Agile is taking over the world. And if you, uh, as a, an individual, you as an organization, you as a country, want to provide testing services to the world, you need to understand the impact that Agile is having and is going to have. I just have a, a quick list of those. Key ideas in Agile are, first of all, self-directed and integrated work teams. Um, the uh, Having developers on one team and, and testers on another is a thing of the past in most Agile projects. And if you want to provide testing services, you're going to have to deal with that issue. Development is now being done in small batches. In some organizations, every two weeks, every three weeks, every four weeks. In other organizations, every day or every hour, new software is developed into production. If you want to be a part of the testing for that, then you're going to have to change your processes, your tools, your culture, your attitude in order to deal with that kind of testing. The days of uh, multiple weeks of planning and then analysis and, and design and execution are long gone. We're doing everything just in time, just in time planning, just in time analysis and design and testing going to have to be ready for that. Um, exploratory testing is becoming far more important than it ever used to be. You need to find a balance between that and scripted testing in your work. And those are just some of the things that I think you need to know about in order to really uh, uh, serve and to compete on a worldwide basis. Uh, I'd last like to ask uh, other people on the panel now if they would like to uh, add other items that they think you should know about. So, building on what I started with, and, and I agree Agile has been the hot buzz topic for about 11 years. I think also every Agile team I've ever seen and reviewed does things slightly differently. I, I'm not sure there's one Agile way so the takeaway for people looking to provide testing services, uh, I think is you need to be flexible. Don't expect Agile to be one way. Don't expect software testing to be one way. Uh, look for the opportunities as they come along, but don't expect each opportunity to be the same as the last opportunity. And that really requires a diversity of, of of skills. It isn't enough just to be a good software tester anymore. That's one of the things Agile teams value is a lot of diversity. So you may need to develop domain expertise, you may need to develop programming skills, uh, skills with tools, uh, soft skills like we just heard from the last speaker to, to be successful. Uh, that's on the individual level. I think there's also a similar set of things that have to happen for companies that could support you in getting uh, test jobs uh, across the world. Thanks. Eric? Yeah, I agree to this. It's a panel discussion, sorry, but, but, but I think, yes, uh, as a tester, it, it's not enough anymore to know just about testing. I think that changes. You're part of a team. And you're expected to do roles or jobs or tasks that are not primarily testing. That requires, yes, the testing needs some scripting skills, some coding skills, requirement skills. It also requires something which is, I think, it's also new for many people. We expect developers to test. But that means we've got to teach them how to test. And that means a tester in a agile team part of it becomes a coach for developers on testing. And I don't think every tester today has coaching skills. So another, I think, challenge for the future. Thanks. Well, 
Okay. I'm a little bit too minded about this whole stuff, what we were discussing. Uh, when I think about a car, I can't imagine you develop a car in the HR way. Not, not today, maybe in 10 years. So I think and it totally depends on the product, I personally think. I can also not imagine that you develop a new version of Amazon uh, Internet Shop uh, within a five year project with well defined tests and everything. To my knowledge, Amazon puts out a new product version every 30 seconds in the world. Every 30 seconds, a test of new versions is going online. So I guess uh, we have to distinguish a little bit between the types of application and then we can discuss maybe several, several types of application and come to some conclusions for them. But in general, saying we have to go HR, I think at least for the car and even more so for the avionic industry is uh, not really the right way to go. I totally agree for new types of application, like web application and things like that. I think um, uh, the, the most important thing of Asia is value. And, uh, value, I think value is achieved by doing valuable works and reducing valueless works. But uh, the present Asia is uh, made in America and I think it's a uh, far too American way. So. We got it, we got it, we got it. And I think um, we have a good to technique to identify value risk and um, in software development in software development and software testing. Uh, I to identify and to reduce value less words. Uh, it, it's easy in manufacturing. Uh, in automotive manufacturing and so on, but uh, it's more difficult in software development way because the automotive cars are made by machines, but uh, software is made by or made by us human beings. Uh, it's a problem of cognitive science. Mm, thank you. Um, we had uh, a couple of ideas here. We, we have a joke in the United States. I don't know if it's going to go over here, but I'll, I'll give it a try. If you can speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you can speak two languages, you're bilingual. If you can speak one language, you're American. <laughs> Um, many of you have the advantage over me in that you speak multiple languages. And if you want to be on the world stage as a tester, you need to cultivate your knowledge of multiple languages so that you can communicate well with others. As we see this agile movement and emerge and we see developers and testers needing to work together, you're going to need to be able to communicate with them in their language. Especially if you're an outsource vendor, you're, you're going to have to communicate in their language. They won't come to you with yours. So continue your your education in various languages, it will only be a benefit to you. Um, one of the things that makes, in my mind, a true professional is a person who makes commitments and then keeps those commitments. I'm sensitive to this because uh, as program chair for these large conferences, I'm seeing more and more speakers who commit to come and speak and then at the last minute call me or email me with some excuse about why they can't come. And to me they're exhibiting a lack of professionalism. Um, you need to learn to make and keep commitments. 
You need to learn to say yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no. And you need to say I understand when you understand and say I don't understand when, I, when you don't understand. Um, these are basic building blocks of professionalism. And uh, again, I think if you want to compete in the world, you need to be professional in your work. Other comments? Please, yeah. So you, you used a word that I want to actually pick out a little bit that was kind of part of the call to mission statement here, which I actually took a more expanded sentence that Lee gave me and, and dissected it and maybe rewrote it a little bit. Uh, and the word compete, I think, in the changing game of the economy, maybe needs to mean different things because it kind of has a negative connotation many times uh, in, in terms of uh, kind of us versus them in, in some sort of maybe a soccer game, which has its place also. But, but I think to be successful, uh, and, and that, that's part of how I read the, the, the statement here, what must Asia, and I would rewrite that to be, and the world, uh, need to work on, not know. Because I'm always working, I don't know everything, I'm always working on. In order to live long and prosper, I don't know if there's any Star Trek folks out there, but uh, to me, I don't want to compete, I want the community, I want all the countries to prosper, all the companies to prosper uh, uh, as a community. So the word compete sometimes rubs me slightly the wrong, wrong way because I'd rather to see us all prosper by learning some of the things we were talking about during this, this meeting uh, on how to do testing better and uh, maybe even certifications and test maturity models and standards and things like that. But to me, they're all part of hopefully prospering because that's what I think the world wants to do is to prosper. Okay, thank you. I, I understand your concern. When I, when I wrote the word compete, what I was thinking Hmm. I've, I've told her not to call me here. <laughs> Let's see where was I? Oh yes. I lost my voice for the reason. Congratulations. She's sitting there. Um. Where was I? Oh yes. When I when I wrote the word compete, what I was thinking of was uh, if Malaysia wants to to join um, as leaders, join the, the world community as testers. They're going to be competing with other nations, bigger nations, um, including China and India. And that, so that was, my, that was my use of the word compete there. Uh, the note that I was handed uh, was not a message from my secret lover. It was, in fact, a note that uh, our, we're supposed to continue until 4.45. So we have a half an hour here, assuming we can find things to say. In that, uh, in that uh, Klaus, uh, Klaus, anything you'd like to add about uh, to our discussion? I I like to be a little bit more provocative, so let, let's let's see how this works. Yeah, um, I heard this morning that um, one goal is um, to do offshore testing and to develop Malaysia further in the market of offshore testing. Listening to your comments, I would say in a few years there is no offshore testing anymore. There's no outsourcing of testing anymore. What do you think about that? I have somewhat of an answer to that. I've been involved in one or two groups that tried and one that sort of uh, succeeded uh, and I wouldn't use the word offshoring, what they were trying to do in an agile sense of a distributed team was have 24 hours a day of production uh, and development. And there was a group in the United States kind of defining what was done, uh, another group uh, in India doing some code, and another group somewhere in Europe uh, doing testing uh, 
all about eight or nine hour shifts with some of it overlapping. Um, and so I saw one of those fail miserably, I saw another one kind of succeed. So I think that might be a, an approach. It's not so much offshoring as a global community uh, working on things. That's very difficult to do, I suspect. Uh, but uh, an interesting strategy to uh, get things done quicker. Yeah, regarding the future of, of outsourcing, of offshoring the difference, um, especially related to, to let's say, Asia, um, I see at least two threats. I mean, um, we talked about Agile already, and Klaus said, well, it's probably only for Microsoft or some applications. I see also big projects, and I told big projects working on safety critical systems moving to Agile. And Agile and, and outsourcing do not match that. Um, so that, that, that's, that's, that's one thing. The other thing which I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm looking at it from a European perspective much more, is that um, Malaysia, India, China are pretty far out. Um, communication is difficult, there's time difference, there is cultural differences. So what we're seeing very largely is that Eastern European countries are playing a major role today in the outsourcing. So we're talking about competing, we should be talking also about how does Malaysia, India, Asia in general compete with Eastern European countries. Because if I run a company um, in the Netherlands and I outsource, I can fly to Poland very, very quickly. And also, if you look at salaries in Poland, it's one to four. So a lot of developers or people in Poland. Um, and this is your, I think, challenge as well. Mm. We are living in 2013 and we are facing the 2015 is the year of ASEAN integration. So for our Asian countries, uh, offshoring is a little bit out of date concept because uh, there is there will be a big market in China and East Russia and uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, Korea, Thailand, and you Malaysia, and so on. So, for, for example, China is customer of Chinese banking, Chinese automotive company, Chinese train companies, and so on, and plant contractor. Uh, Flap system integrator, maybe Malaysian company, and you order a lot of develop development work to America or Europe countries because Malaysia is so near to Asian countries, nearer than. Europe or America. So, uh, you, I think you have to graduate the offshoring concept. You can be the plan contractor. So, Malaysia have, has to be, Malaysia has to prepare to be plan contractor. Another thing perhaps we should talk about when we talk about offshoring, outsourcing, um, and also the movement of Agile is what can be outsourced and, and what could be added value or, or when are you can differentiate. And one of the things which I keep coming up as well is that maybe performance testing or security testing, so very technical issues, um, would be a, a wake up call um, if you become D country or D countries region where this is where they actually understand security testing. This is where they actually understand performance testing or liability testing. Um, that could be a way forward to still have outsourcing going on, but it needs special skills. So let me summarize what I've heard. Oh, please. Yeah. Can I have the last one? Of course. Uh, I think the, the last point, uh, in my point of view, is a very important one. Uh, in the future, it will not be based on money. Will be based on skills, so skill development. I think 
is the crucial thing. And not only in, in testing, but in whole system development. Due to HR and due to the cross-section things, and also due to the round-the-clock time shifts of teams, not of uh, separation between requirements, architect, implementer and tester. So skill, I think, is the, is the issue. Yeah. Not only in testing. Uh, I'd like to add to that even. I would put skills and uh, the right kinds of environments and tools uh, to, to support that, which implies another set of skills to, to run and use those environments. An environment that including, uh, again, something Malaysia and the other countries can work on, a seamless ability to communicate around the world across time zones and things like that. Which, by the way, we're all faced with those challenges. None of us know exactly how to do those things. These things are all evolving, I think, as we, as we speak. Uh, but somebody's going to figure these things out, I, I, I do believe. And so now let me try and summarize the, the three things that I've heard here, the three different ideas. First, um, many organizations would like to have round-the-clock development. And one way to do that is to have round-the-world development. And you could be a part of that. Is that what you were saying? Um, the second thing was that there are certain parts of the testing world process that can fairly easily be segmented Things like security testing, privacy testing, performance testing. And you could be a leader in that area. And then the third idea was currently, maybe most software is built in North America and Asia, excuse me, North America and Europe. And some of that testing then is being outsourced to Asia, but that need not be the model of the future. Asia can be a leader in software development also. And you could be a part of the testing in that software development. So it strikes me that there's a, a bright future there. I would then have to ask, who are the leaders in Malaysia? Who are the thought leaders? Who are bringing forth new ideas, new processes, new concepts, new tools? Um, as I visit, uh, well, I'll just be straight honest here. As I visit India, I see a, a nation uh, in, the, uh, in terms of IT who are great followers. And, and I mean that in the best sense. They, they have adopted ideas. They can execute processes. They are intelligent people. But I see very few leaders. I see very few um, people who are ready to, to take software development, software testing there to the next level. They are excellent followers. Give them a process and they can follow uh, I hope I'm not being offensive to anyone here. Um, but I, I only have met a, a couple of people in a huge nation who are really leading out and, and talking about new ways of testing, new and innovative ideas. Um, that's what you need to do. And uh, so that, that would be the challenge that I would leave with you is it's important that we understand the old ways. It's important that we understand current processes. But as I said in my talk yesterday, the successes of the past can blind us. They can prevent us from having successes in the future. And uh, you need, as individuals and organizations, to step up and be innovative, try new things. It in many fields, they work on process and rely on process, and certainly in parts of industry, factories and things like that rely on process. I think process is necessary to a point, 
a lot of other professions talk about practice. Uh, medical doctors talking about practice. Uh, why? Because it takes so long, not only to just understand the basic concepts that you get in school and certifications, but then to continue to practice to get to the point where you understand enough to innovate. As I said, myself and the majority of people here on the panel have been practicing, I think, for, well, if I add up real quickly, you know, over, maybe over 200 years. I'm not, I'm not sure about Nishi, but, yeah, but the practice allows the innovation to come. So you've got to spend a lot of time practicing to get smart enough to, to do the innovation. I agree, innovation is an important thing to, to lead on. Uh, very few people get there. I'm, I'm not sure I'm there. Appreciate that, John. Good thoughts. Yeah, just to, to, to add on to what Lee was saying, I think what needs to change when we're talking about wake up calls is that, and this is a European, also American perspective, is we see Asia still as a resource. And, and if you want to survive, in the next 10 years, we become a center of excellence, which I mentioned this morning, or at least play in Champions League, um, be good at some things, and it needs to be at the skills, not our resources only. But it does need also leadership. It does need that we have to start looking at Malaysia and Asia differently. That what will happen, that change, from your to yes. That's your change to come back. You have to become leaders of innovation. Uh, it's not about resources and about what's killed anymore. I think this is, and then if that happens, it's not about agile or outsourcing anymore. That's a change perspective. I think that's the main change that could happen um, for the future. Just to add on this, uh, I heard a lot of times India and things like that. I would have preferred to hear much more Korea, LG, and Samsung, for example. That's the way to go, and uh, that's not a resource anymore. That's the world leadership in a, in a certain market. And you need testing skills, you need software skills, but you also need systems engineering skills for, for that. I think the time just for cheap workload and cheap um, to save cost to do this um, outside uh, the, the high developed countries, I think this time is so long. And it's really about developing unique and world leading products also in the internet area. Good, thank you. Now, we've been asked to take questions from you, our audience. And we have some microphones here that are placed around the room. And we welcome you to come up to a mic to ask a question. You can ask a question either to the panel as a whole, we'll attempt to answer it, or you can ask an individual person. I'm assuming the microphones are turned on and ready to go. So, do we have a... Uh, I try not to all rush to the microphones at once. I don't want anyone being hurt. Be brave. Hello. Hello. Uh, can I have one question? I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Barely. Can we turn the game up on the mic, please? Hello? No, that's good. Uh -huh. So, uh, I think software testing is quite new in the uh, special measure. So, how to train a good uh, software tester? What is the, uh, let's say, for example, the basic uh, knowledge a student needs to acquire to, in order to become a good uh, software tester? That's the question to all panels. Yeah. Let me see if I can restate your question. It's what do you think makes good training for a software tester? Yes. For example, is it... Training, education? What, sorry, uh, is it with uh, IT knowledge or programming knowledge is sufficient to become a good software tester? Because some uh, applications, for example, involve embedded programming. Uh, without understanding electronic engineering, maybe they cannot uh, come up with a good test method. All right, good, excellent question, thank you. Who'd like to start? I'll, I guess I'll start. In the notion of building on the practice, 
I think you start your education even in high school, continue into college. When I used to be a hiring manager, all I thought college meant was that I could train you. Uh, once you get past those things, then you can start thinking about uh, skills in areas like, uh, say, certification kind of thing, like ISTQB, or there's many other kinds of uh, classes and accreditations one can look at. But again, speaking as a hiring manager, and I think everybody has to keep in mind, once you have a base level, say, like some certification, that doesn't mean that you're good at practicing testing yet, which is why I mentioned earlier, I think once you get those things and get that basic training, and most of us here do training, uh, then you gotta go out and actually practice. And I would even extend that as a challenge to everybody. You've heard a lot of good things yesterday, today, and you'll hear some more things in the next couple of days. The practice that I'm talking about, you're getting some education now, practice I'm talking about, that's the hard part to actually take it back to wherever you're working at and practice one of those things, actually do it. And, and that's the education path that I see. A little bit of training, lots of lots of practice. Yeah, I think I, I kind of agree uh, more. It's one of the things which actually I think goes wrong a lot in the world. Uh, um, I've been training a lot of ICTGB and ICTGB is, is basic, it's also advanced nowadays. A lot of training, you can actually go to a level, but it's still theory. Um, quite often what happens is people invest companies in training, get people, let's say, ICTGB certified, but that's only the beginning. And that is, again, a wake up call. I've come across many, many organizations who spend a lot of money getting all people trained, and then they stand out to their jobs, and that is it. It only starts on the training. You gotta in, have some, some kind of internal mechanism to, to share experiences, to talk about things, to, to review each other's test plans, to, to uh, um, do the practice. It, it's doing it also, it's learning, it, it, it's sharing knowledge, things like that. Klaus, uh, what do you can you tell us a little bit about software training uh, in your part of the world? What, what, what kind of program or process do people go through to become software testers? And then I will ask you the same question. I think the differentiation also we made, uh, I would agree with you, there's a difference in training, so learning something, like learning to read English, and it's a whole different story to write your first English sentence or even a whole English book. It's a whole different thing. And this is why uh, training also requires an additional education, requires an addition a lot of practice. So this is one thing I absolutely agree. The second thing, I think, uh, at least to my observation from large companies we work with, it's a similar thing happening like uh, it happened with programming 15 years ago in some countries, maybe even only today. Where in the 80s, at least in Germany, if you were able to write COBOL or C, you got a job. And whatever it was uh, the programming about, if it was a banking application, if it was a process automation, if people know a programming language, they program a little bit, they were hired and they uh, were put in the job. This is over, this is not happening today. Not in programming, also not in testing, at least in Germany. You require domain knowledge. The time where somebody works in each domain, maybe aerospace, maybe automotive, maybe banking application, maybe energy, maybe uh, internet application, whatever you can think of, and he get a job because he has basic knowledge and a lot of experience in testing is all at least in Germany almost very uh, close to, to over because especially for testing, I really think you need, except for unit testing, a lot of domain knowledge. If you do system testing and especially the system acceptance test, you have to have a lot of domain knowledge. So in addition to the training and the work experience, I think it's a very good idea to specialize in some domains, but not in one. Thank you. So my answer is, listen to my lecture in my university. It's just a joke. It's a rough point. And uh, my answer, my uh, real answer is, do 
test anything. Actually, anything. Okay, do test anything, and you you will miss bags. So, uh, and you have to analyze bags you missed. Think why you missed the bags. So, bags you missed will be a good teacher. And the bugs, uh, it's a good teacher, tells you your weak point of testing skills. Bugs you missed is a uh, good teacher. Yes, please. Um, and then told from two large com companies. So when, when we introduced the new way of testing, uh, one was about 10 years back, the other one uh, eight, 8 years back, um, we took the test managers in separate rooms, so five of them in one company, ten in the other, in separate rooms, and we gave them a problem they had within the company, and we told them to write test cases. So we looked at the test cases. Guess how many of them were similar? How many overlap of tests? Take the ten ones. Ten test managers, all knowledge about the domain, all very experienced people, they know the product and we put it in separate rooms and give them a goal for a certain type of system test. Guess how many different te test cases we got? Or how many similar ones? Non similar. So, not non the same. Some of them similar, but non the same. Why? Because they all had different requirements in their head. So in addition to what we had, I forgot this before, I think it's also important to know how to write good requirements so you can challenge the requirements engineer and say, look, this might be a requirement in your point of view, but this is nothing I can ever test. So I think having knowledge about requirements engineering and how to read the right requirements in a way that you can test them is equally important to test knowledge. Okay, let me see if I can read them. We've got training. We've got practice, we've got domain specialization, and let's see. Okay. And um, I'm trying to think. reflection, reflection, self reflection. Um, asking yourself, why did I do that? How did I do that? How did I find that back? How did I miss that? This, this introspection, this self-reflection. Um, and uh, I, I guess I would add a little, just a little bit here, and that is just an insatiable desire to try and figure out how things work and see if you can break them. It's just fun. Oh, and you have to have what we call a thick skin. In other words, you can't, you can't be susceptible to uh, criticism. Because people will criticize you for basically every time you find a defect, it's like telling someone their baby is ugly, and they won't like that. So you have to be able to deal with that. Excellent question. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. How about how about another question? Let's see how much more time we have here. All right, we have three and a half days. Sorry. Uh, another question from our distinguished audience. We have time for one more. Something you've just been burning to ask some of us. All of us. One of us. None of us. <laughs> Going through all the combinations there. How many combinations? Yeah, so you have a tester. Do you try all the combinations? So how many combinations are there? <laughs> right, one more question. So, thank you. Evening. Um, I see a lot of companies in Malaysia are moving towards the agile methodology right now. But what I can see about my company is that there's a lot of stereotyping happening in the agile team. So they still see tester as a tester in waterfall. So how can we actually avoid these kind of situations? Could you repeat the question? Could you speak a little more slowly? Please? So, 
a lot of companies in Malaysia are moving towards the Java methodology. So in my company, so we see a lot of problems like uh, stereotyping of agile testers. So how can we actually avoid this kind of problem? Help us understand what you mean by stereotyping virtual testing. It means that the developers see the tester as just a tester. So they are not supposed to do scripting or coding. And the testers see themselves as a tester only and they are not supposed to do coding as well. Okay. Do, you, do you mean the testers aren't supposed to do coding? Yeah, this is uh, the current perception. So how can we actually avoid that so that uh, testers can involve uh, Participate uh, in, as a agile team, as a agile member. So, so you as a tester want to be able to do some coding in Java and things like that. Yeah, I think they should be quite uh, have more skill sets to be part of an agile team. Right? Um, well, in my case, speaking personally, when I ran into programmers that thought I was just a tester, uh, I wrote some code. <coughs> Uh, and got it to execute, maybe some test automation, and I really wasn't too concerned with them saying, oh, you're a tester, you can't write code. Uh, I wrote code to solve problems. Uh, that's what programmers do, that's what they like to do, they have to solve problems with code. When they see a tester starting to solve problems with code, that kind of puts a stop to the, oh, you're a tester, you don't know what you're doing in the coding world. Uh, that, that was my personal solution, is I wrote good code uh, that would test their software and find bugs. Okay, um, we are just running a project with a company with 400 uh, developers. In all in HR, sprints two weeks, one week, most two and a half. And what we introduced there was, I think, a very good concept, which is uh, one HR team who does the development develops the test cases in parallel to the development. And then it then handles over the code and the test cases to another HR team, and the other HR team does the test of this one, so they swap. So there are no testers, no developer anymore, there are teams, they work together, they have different skills, even a test manager in each team, and when they have written and designed the test cases, then they swap the test cases and the developed code to the other team, they do the test, they get the feedback, so no problem at all, and I think it's a very good way to do so. Other comments for this good question? I'm trying to think of something brilliant to say. Have fun. So, well, uh, yeah, I know about brilliance. For those that uh, I'll, I'll keep talking to y'all we here. Uh, you know, but I'm gonna stop you yeah, about three weeks. Leo we'll, we'll keep him on. I, I would extend it even a little bit further. Um, way too often programmers just think, well, I'll write in Java, that's the only language. One of the things we see in the industry some places, and there was a talk uh, tutorial on it um, yesterday, is the notion of model-based uh, development at the system level, the software level, and even the test level. Um, that starts abstracting away from even writing code and things like that to writing models. And so some of my answer would be to start saying, well, uh, you guys just doing nothing but programming. Uh, that's kind of old school. Uh, can you create models? And testers can create independent models. So you want something that's, uh, I'll say, maybe next generation down the road. Uh, and it may not be applicable to all domains, but it's happening in some of them. Uh, learn how to do modeling and show the developers that they may be out of a job writing Java because everybody's going to be working in models. By the way, I've heard that for 30 years. It doesn't happen, but uh, it, it, it may happen in a few select domains. Do you have a quick comment? No. Right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some grandfatherly advice here. Um, I'll give you some great-grandfatherly advice. I have two great grandchildren. Um, don't wait for permission to show how good you are. Just do it. 
If something needs to be done, if code needs to be written, if a test case needs to be written, the framework needs to be created, if um, test data needs to be created, just go do it. Show how good you are. And uh, it'll confound the critics pretty quickly. And, and you'll, be, uh, you'll be a valued part of the team. Um, that, 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 I want to leave this, this final bit of advice with you today because we have to close. Um, internally, you can focus on process. But externally, don't talk process. Don't tell people, you know, about test case counts and defect detection percentage and stuff like that. Focus on value. Talk value. Show value. Be valuable to your team. That's what you need to do. Everything else will move out of the way. Everything else will respect your value. They'll come to you. Yeah, they'll come to you. Our time is up. Um, I hope you've uh, enjoyed our discussion. I hope you've gotten something valuable out of it. We thank you for your time. We thank you for your questions. Um, it's time for us to go because others are ready. Thank you very, thank you very much to our very esteemed panel. Thank you for a very, very riveting session.